get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the same And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm really excited. We have Tom Bilyeu. He's co-founder of Quest Nutrition, which was named the second fastest growing private company in America with over 1,400 employees and 57,000% growth. Tom's mission is to end metabolic disease, and we will see that, the, the passion, where that comes from early on in life. He also hosts a thought leadership show. I, you know, I really encourage anyone to check it out. It's called Inside Quest, where he features people like Tim Ferriss, Russell Simmons, Tony Robbins, many more. And if you want to get out of the matrix, you have to listen to Tom. Tom, thanks for joining me. Man, thanks for having me. It's really an honor to be here. You know, um, I always like to include a couple of fun facts that most people don't know about you. Um, and one is you dressed up for Halloween many, many times, and the majority <laughs> was a ninja. Yes, yes. Why was this on your mind lately? Um, somebody just asked me something about it. Oh, uh, just yesterday, I was interviewing a guy named Jim Quick on Inside Quest. I know Jim, yeah, yeah. Uh, Jim's such a good he's dude, amazing. and I really, really like that guy. And he's got just a, a truly robust appreciation for uh, comic books and comic book characters, and I, I share that. And I actually find it really interesting when serious people who've accomplished a lot in their lives have that that's still um, a real pull to the mythology and everything of superheroes. And uh, it just got me thinking about my how early I got into, I'll, I'll call ninjas a superhero of sorts. Right. Um, uh, you know, being into that and right. um, just, yeah, he and I were talking about that and it got me thinking I hadn't said that out loud in, in a long time. So. It's keeping that childhood spark going. And there's two fun facts I, from my research, um, pulled out. And one, you may, after this, you may hate me for it, but I'm going to say it anyways. Um, I have a self-proclaimed talent where I could spot celebrity lookalikes and I couldn't for the life of me think of who you look like. Okay. And then I finally figured it out, and it's the opposite of what you want to embody. Um, <laughs> okay. okay so it, Agent Smith from The Matrix. Really? Yes. Okay. Okay. A celebrity look like. So I want nice. you to talk a little bit about the, your, the Matrix and how it's influenced you. Wow. Yeah. The, uh, the Matrix certainly has influenced me. I, I think many people think in narrative. I certainly fall, if that's a spectrum, I fall way to the end of people that think almost exclusively in narrative. Yeah. So that movie came right at a time in my life when I felt like I could be more, I could do something more with my life, but I felt trapped, but I didn't know by what. I mean, these were the actual words that I was saying to myself in yeah. my head. And then I go see this movie, and that's the literal dialogue that's being said, right? At the beginning of the movie, he's right. saying, you know, I think I could be more. And, yeah. and I think it's Trinity who says to him, you know, but you feel trapped. And what is that thing? That right. It was exactly okay. playing in your head, yeah. Right. So I was like, oh, my. So I just resonated with it right away. But then it really becomes, uh, you know, when you watch it more and more, it is the perfect allegory for what – um, any human being goes through because I think that once you realize the matrix is just a mindset and the thing that holds you back is the way that you view the world, the way you frame it, conceptualize it, um, and it's essentially a fixed mindset and that the, the key to getting out of the matrix is to develop a growth mindset, yeah. like then now everything in that movie sort of slots in place. So I didn't have those words, the growth mindset and all of that to be able to articulate to people the entrepreneur's journey. So what I had was the matrix. And the matrix allowed me to understand what I was trying to accomplish in my own life, the things that I needed to do to realize that to bend the spoon is impossible, only to realize that there is no spoon, mm -hmm. right? That right. you think that's air you're breathing. You right. know, all those things that gave me the chills now, mm -hmm. all those things that as you sit and think about what they're trying to teach you, that the thing that stands between you and Kung Fu is only knowledge and practice, right? So it was like, oh my gosh, it, knowledge, practice, and then the realization that there are certain rules that you believe in that are totally fake, right? So you're in this construct uh, yeah. and you're doing martial arts and you think you're tired, you think you're breathing heavily, but there's really no oxygen. I mean, it's, ah! it's like even now just telling you like I re-get back into it. So 
Um, all of that stuff just coalesced for me in my early 20s and sent me on this journey of self-discovery of trying to learn not literal kung fu but mental kung fu right, and right. trying to, to, to further um, use movies as a, an ongoing metaphor. I wanted to become a Jedi, right? So I wanted to – and what that means to me is I wanted to be able to influence people. Yeah. And there's an awesome quote, I forget who said it, but the greatest form of mind control is control over your own mind. Mm. So my quest to be a Jedi is really a quest to gain control over my own mindset to ultimately free myself from the Matrix. Yeah, yeah. And I encourage anyone to check out Tom's reading list because at the top, Carol Dweck, right, which some of the sure. exact stuff you're talking about uh, talks about that. Um, so this kind of feeds into Inside Quest. When did you decide I just – you needed to start Inside Quest. You know, it's interesting. I had to be drug into Inside Quest. Really? Yeah. My team had been suggesting it for a long time. I'm super introverted. So every every bit of me acting the extrovert That's right amazing. now. That's amazing. I would you would never know. Yeah, it is purely a technique that I have learned, gets me a certain result. And so I um and look, it you know, if it's a scale, right? I'm not like hyper introverted. I'm not. Uh, I don't have social anxiety or anything like that. Right. But I very much, when I want to recharge, I I want to be alone. I want to read a book. I want to get yeah, totally yeah. into my own universe. And and yeah. I don't go to a party. And I oh, you know, I want to be around people. That's that's not my shtick. So right, right. Um, doing it, being up in front of people, saying, "Hey, look at me!" Like that really didn't sit well with me mm. for a long time. Uh, How did they drag yeah, you? They, they know what my mission is, right? So mm. the mission of Quest Nutrition is to end metabolic disease, but the grander mission of, of me is to really help people um, free themselves from the matrix and become their best self, right? So yeah. why did I want to end metabolic disease? Because I believe that is the single biggest factor holding people back mentally. It was yeah. always a mental game, right? When you look at somebody who's really unhappy, chances are that there's also something going on in the body. And, and as you see people slide to ill health, you see an, uh, uh, if happiness were an index, you would see it go down with that same decline. And I don't think that you can see somebody who's profoundly unhealthy be profoundly happy. I think that those two are so yeah. inextricably tied. So when I looked at my family and I saw them struggling with obesity, I said, okay, my answer wasn't I want to make them lean in my words, skinny by most people's words. Right, right. That, that wasn't my goal. My goal was to make them happy. And then I was like, okay, what do I need to do to actually make them happy? Hmm. And step number one was help them get their body right. Because the truth is the, the body's a reflection of the mind. So something was going on in their mind that triggered into the body. And there's two ways to go about it. You can go directly to the body, get the body in shape and get them in a virtuous cycle where they look better, feel better, and they start feeling better about themselves, which you know, just brings a brightness, a happiness to their mentality, or you can go straight to the mind. And I just thought, I probably have an easier time getting people to eat chocolate chip cookies than, that are good for you. Uh, <laughs> Hence the flavors of a quest, right? Yeah. Literally. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that seemed a lot easier than doing Inside Quest first, uh, where, you know, you, it, Inside Quest speaks to a very particular type of person, somebody who has an entrepreneurial mindset, they really want to grow, they want to get better. Right. But those are the people that are less in trouble, right? So the people that, that see, are yeah. farther at the other end of that spectrum, it's like I wanted to be a catalyst for that change, largely because I started in such a dark place. So for me, like I know what that's like. I know how that feels. And to have a helping hand, to have somebody reach out and say, yeah. hey, look, um, you can be something great. Like I really believe that. Yeah. And to, to extend that and to pick you back up off your feet, that's just incredibly meaningful. To yeah, me. yeah. I want you to talk about, if you're comfortable, that dark place. You know, because one of my other facts that most people may not know about you is you used to be 230 pounds. And so I wanted to talk about the pre-230 pound mindset to the post-230 pound mindset. But, but talk about the dark place first. So what do you, when you say dark place, what do you mean? Well, I, I've, I've actually gone through a few what I'll call dark periods in my life. The first, when, when I saw The Matrix, um, that was a, a different kind of dark period. I was lost. Okay? And it's one thing to, to be lost and not know what to do, how to do. and to, to, that, that comes with it a sense of hopelessness. Yeah. Um, it didn't 
know how to take action. I had a fixed mindset. My talents and intelligence in my mind were fixed and they couldn't be changed. So I was always trying to put myself in positions to be the smartest person in the room. Uh, I often argued for dumb ideas just because they were mine and I valued myself um, for being right. And if you value yourself for being right and you want to value yourself, right, every human being is going to find a way to feel good about themselves, yeah. even if they have to shrink their world down to you know, being the smartest guy in a room full of people that aren't that bright, uh, which is not a very great way to live your life. But they'll do that, right? They'll do that because they want to feel good about themselves. And I was that guy. So I was, I had, um, I actually referred to myself at that time as the king of remedial jobs. And the reason that I called myself that was I didn't want to go into interview for a job that I knew I wouldn't get. Mm. So I would only interview for jobs where I knew I'm going to go in and I'm going to be the smartest guy that interviews for this position. They'll definitely offer me the job. But I was getting jobs that like were total dead end, punch in, punch out. I'm really unhappy. And of course I was because I was only that was what you labeled yourself. literally yeah. going for yeah. remedial jobs. Yeah. So, what was your so, worst job that you had? Uh, the worst job was one that my mom wouldn't let me take. So I never actually did it, uh, but I, I accepted a position driving uh, models, lingerie models from uh, <laughs> Why job. is that a worst job? Uh, because uh, as okay. when my mom really put her finger to it, she was like, they're basically escorts. And I was like, oh my God, you're right. It was so embarrassing. I was young. Um, so yeah, I, I never actually did it, but that, that was the kind of thing. And I thought, whoa, this is amazing. Like it pays really well. And all I have to do is, is sit in a car and drive. This will be incredible. I'll get this. It'll be a slam dunk. So, and in the interview, the guy said like, why are you interviewing for this job? You're too smart for this. Really? Which wow. was like, oh God, that was music to my ears. It's all I wanted to hear. I'm too smart. Oh wow. So it, it was just really stupid. So that all left me feeling like, uh, I don't know what to do with my life. You know, I'm. I, I had big dreams for what I was going to accomplish in my life. I've ha I have all these grand ambitions, and I have absolutely no idea how to make that come true. And there's some, there is a unique corner of hell for people who have grand ambition and absolutely no understanding of how to make it come true. Mm -hmm. And so that was number the first dark place, that hopelessness. What was the, you said there were three. What was the yeah. second one? Well, there, there's two. So the, the next one was... Um, I was successful and totally miserable. So yeah. I thought what I wanted to be was rich. I thought money is going to answer all of my problems. Uh, I will do anything and everything to become wealthy. Yeah. Uh, I helped build a company that was... This is Awareness was, Technologies. Yeah, and it yeah. was a good company. It was fine. It just wasn't my passion. I didn't care about it. Yeah. So here I was putting all of this time and energy, and I was constantly... Um, pulled away from my wife, whom I love more than you could possibly imagine, anything for fun all i do every day is think of ways to make more money mm -hmm. and you feel like you know people will say i can do anything for 15 minutes right so i would just live in these tiny little increments of mm -hmm. right now i can keep working right now i can keep working and just sort of looking super myopic mm -hmm. and for it was like six and a half years i didn't take a vacation i yeah. worked saturday sunday if i was awake i was either working out or working on the business that was it and um, I would fit my wife into those things and, you know, we would, um, every now and then we might do something on the weekend, but we didn't, I mean, we didn't go away for our anniversary, nothing. It was just like this, this, you know. You have a very understanding wife, it sounds like. My wife, dude, this woman is legit times 10. She's the most incredible human being. I would not be the person that I am without her. That is for sure. Yeah, don't, I'll go off on a tangent for the rest of your show talking about. What That's okay. About. This is about tangents. We'll go wherever you take us. But, um, you know, the, what snapped you out of that? You said, you know, at Awareness Technology, so you were chasing the money. You made a lot of sacrifices. What was the final straw that kind of just snapped you to reality? Misery. I don't think human beings are meant to sustain misery for too long. And I think that, you know, you look, look at a drug addict, right? What really is it normally the thing that kicks them into recovery is they hit rock bottom. Right. So I hit emotional rock bottom. I got to the point where even looking at that, I can't do this for 15 minutes anymore. Like I'm, I'm now, I'm totally fried. I feel like I've wasted, you know, the last, at that point, it was probably six and a half years or so. I've wasted, mm -hmm. now I've reframed that since then, so don't worry, I don't right, think right. it's being a waste anymore. But at the time, like that's where I was, right? I've wasted yeah. this time. 
Um, I've got money. I got the thing that I always said I wanted, and it's it's totally empty. So yeah. let's live in the cliche of money can't buy happiness, and which was ironic because I really believe in the power of money, and I think money is the great facilitator, and it makes possible all those amazing things that people want to do. And now that I have true wealth, both financially and mm. spiritually, I get it, but I didn't get it at the time. Yeah. Um, and so hitting rock bottom and realizing I. The most precious commodity we all have is time, and I have wasted. I've sold my time cheaply, yeah, and, and I'm not willing to do that anymore. Yeah. And, and so that was that was it. And that that was one of those hard and fast moment in the sand. My life's never been the same since. Yeah, Tom. So I want to build, go up to you know, talk about awareness, technology, and quest. But I think a lot of it, you know, is that wealth and health um, goes into the mindset, um, the pre mindset when you're turning 30 pounds and then the post turn 30 pounds. Talk about the difference, the pre turn 30 mindset and the post. You know, I think that the mindset shift actually comes before you decide to start, right? Mm -hmm. So um, the body is, is not just a reflection of the mind, but it's an amazing opportunity to sculpt your mind. So take uh, muscle gain, take fat loss, you one, you, so let me back up. We all tell ourselves a narrative. That narrative is critically important and it's going to determine who you are and how you feel about yourself. And it's all made up, by the way. So you can choose to tell yourself an empowering narrative or a destructive narrative, all based on the exact same circumstances. So I could tell myself the narrative of not being very smart, which actually is quite true. If you look at intelligence as the raw ability to process data, I'm terrible. I'm, I am so slow at processing data. Uh, and I have two business partners who are legitimately like take an IQ test, just off the charts, intelligent. Um, so I can tell myself the narrative of being dumb, which doesn't seem very helpful. Um, or I can tell myself the narrative of I'm a fast learner. Mm. I have more discipline than the next person. I'm willing to suffer more in service of my goals than the next person. And both of those things are true. I have an objectively lower IQ than my business partners. But I'm not going to focus on that. What I'm going to focus on is a growth mindset, the acquisition of skills, the mm -hmm. fact that I'm willing to do things that other people are not, right? So you hear those quotes about, hey, uh, every time you don't train, someone else is training, and when you meet, they will beat you because they're more right. prepared. Right. Like, I'm that guy right. that's out training. Right. That's Mark so Devine, who you had on your show, too, yes. says that as well. He's thinking of that guy training in a cave who he's going to meet one day. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so when you begin to tell yourself that narrative, like it just empowers you. So uh, for me it was sculpting my body was telling myself the narrative and proving it to myself. I show up every day. Okay, now that gets to be part of my narrative, right? I yeah. get to honestly say that and believe it because I see myself doing it. Yeah. So hey, I'm the guy with more discipline than the next yeah. person. I prove that by showing up five days a week into the yeah. gym. Yeah. I'm the guy that's willing to suffer more in service of what I want. I prove that because I want to put this weight down, but I don't. Yeah. Um, I'm the guy that's willing to learn and look stupid because I just want to get better. And I'm proving that every day as I ask questions yeah. like, whoa, how'd you do that? Rather than trying to look cool as yeah. I'm adding muscle, yeah. losing fat, I'm just asking, trying to learn, 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 learn. So yeah. um, going through that transition really changed it took the narrative that I told myself to get myself yeah. in the gym and then yeah. every day proved it to myself with these very small little victories right. which gave me the confidence to keep going and then that confidence carried outside of the gym right. as well. Right. I love that, changing your narrative. How did you even have the awareness on changing your narrative and then what to change it to? Did you have a mentor? I've had so many mentors, it's crazy, and virtually all of them have come in the form of books, which is why I'm so obsessed about getting the message of read, read, read. Like, if you don't know what to do to train and improve your life, read. Simple as. Like, don't, right. don't even worry what. Just make it nonfiction would be my advice, but even fiction has some amazing tales to offer. Um, but my transformation came when I started just reading, reading like my life depended on it. Yeah. I mean, I... Because it does, right? Yeah, yeah, certainly your success depends on it. Yeah, yeah. And so I want to talk about the beginning of awareness technologies. Um, how did you meet your, your co-founders, Ron and Mike? They saw me give a lecture on how to use media to influence behavior. So my background is filmmaking, so I've been thinking about psychology yeah. for a very long time, which is part of why I'm self-aware. 
Um, I've just been so immersed in psychology, the brain. In the beginning, it was all about understanding my audience and where they were and how to take them on an emotional journey to tell the story. Yeah. Um, and then I began to realize, wait, this translates to relationships. It translates to marketing and all of that. So I was giving this talk. They heard the talk and they said, wow, this guy um, has a pretty interesting worldview. We like that he approaches things from the point of psychology. Um, Maybe we could get him to come on board and help us build this new company that we just started called Awareness Technologies. So they brought me on before there was even a product. Um, so at a cocktail party, I would call myself one of the founders of that company. In reality, they hired me as a copywriter, but they brought me on before um, there was a product. It was so, like the inception of the company. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. So super, super early. Um, and yeah, that's how so we So at met. that time, did you want to make movies? Oh yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So their their promise to me was, um, look, you're coming to the the film industry with your hand out, you're begging for money, and you're not in control. You want to be in control, right? And I was like, yes, I want to be in control. <laughs> I said, awesome. Come learn business, get right. rich, right. and then go back to the industry and yeah. and make films. And I thought, get rich, yeah, good <laughs> advice. Always been interested in that. Let's go get rich. And uh, so I go into the business thinking, 18 months, we'll sell the company. I'll be rich. This will be amazing. Right? right? I can do anything for 15 minutes. Then you become the next Spielberg, right? You start making yeah, that, movies. That, that was the plan. And then um, 18 months turns into six and a half years, turns into ultimately almost eight and a half years before we finally sold the company and, and moved on to Quest. But through that, that journey changed my life. It changed me fundamentally as a human being. And I realized that, the promise of control was true uh, and realizing that I could take extreme ownership in my life, that I could control every aspect of my life, that I could do way more, as, yeah. even as lofty as my dreams were, that I could do way more than that. You know, to, you mentioned Mark Devine. Mark Devine has this concept of 20x. You're capable of 20x more than you think you are even right. when you're totally maxed out. Like when you hit that wall and you think, I couldn't possibly give anything else. You've got 20 times more to give at that moment. Right. And that really rang true to me. And building a business taught me that, that that's absolutely true and, and really has become a, a center thing in my life now. So, Tom, um, what are some big lessons you learned from each of your co-founders? What's the lessons you learned from Ron and what's the lessons you learned from Mike? Yeah, so from Ron, that's, that's very easy um, to be a student in all things. And, and Ron embodies that in the extreme. That guy is so smart. And yet he'll put himself at the foot of anybody and listen intently with no effort to make them think he's cool. Yeah. Like he just wants that next piece of knowledge. And to see somebody so powerful do that was always just incredibly inspiring to me. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I hope that everybody embodies that. It's, it's just incredibly powerful. Yeah. And then for Mike, man, nobody ever under any circumstance is ever going to outwork that kid. He is unstoppable. He's like the Terminator. He really? will be there at all times. You, you can't beat Mike. Mike is he, he's just untouchable. The kid is... is um, yeah, he's, he is an incredible human being. What do they say they learn from you? I've never asked them that, so I wouldn't want to uh, put words in their mouth. I, I will say I interviewed them both on Inside Quest. I, I watched it, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can't remember if they ever said anything like that in the interview, but, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm curious. I won't, I'm, I'm curious what they would say. Um, so talk about the day you quit. You actually went into them, right, and you decided to, to hand all your – your yeah. stock back in. Yeah. So one, um, I, I live by a code of ethics that is very intense for me. Um, I do anything that's in a line with my code and I never act out of accordance with that. Um, and to me, being on a team is just so critical. So um, I earned equity in that company, sweat equity. I never invested a dime, but my performance just became so, and this they, they will be the first to tell you this, my performance became so undeniable that just to make sure that I didn't leave, they gave me equity in the company. Right. Um, but for me, if you don't cross the finish line, I don't think you should get anything for that. So yeah. knowing that I was quitting before the job was done, right. um, it, it just didn't make sense. So I sat before them and I said, look, you know, we've become brothers through all of this, um, but I'm so miserable and so unhappy. Like I, I just can't do this anymore. So I slid my equity metaphorically across the table. Right, right. Um, it, and just said, I, I can't do this anymore. Um, thank you. And left. 
And they were so shocked and they called me. I'm literally pulling into my driveway thinking that's all behind me now. Uh, that's you know, a real tough move. decision to come to also. I'm sure it wasn't it, easy for you to, to do that. That After was that eight years, yeah. seven years, eight years? At, at the time that I did that, was six and a half years yeah, in. Yeah. So six and a half years was sort of a demarcation point in my life. Yeah. Um, and said, you know, I just I, I can't do this anymore, and I'm going to live a life of passion. So I'm I'm headed home, you know, filled with um, the the freedom of knowing yeah. whatever I do next is going to be something I care so much about that even if I fail, I'm going to be filled with joy. Right, and right. I'm pulling into the driveway. The phone rings. It's them. I answer, and they said, look, come out to dinner with us. And these guys are my brothers. I have so much love for them, honestly, right. and, and it will become clear in this story yeah. how meaningful that is to me. But I was just like, for these guys, I would do anything. So right. um, I went out to dinner, and they said the very fateful words, we could do this without you, but we don't want to. Mm. And, and in that moment, I realized that I had to confess that my highest value in business because we had made a pact with each other that we would do whatever we needed to do to make the company more profitable so right, right. give up uh, an anniversary um, show up at 2 a.m. on a Saturday night anything we would do it to, to build that business yeah. and um, at that moment I said that isn't what drives me money isn't what drives me what drives me is camaraderie it's the connection it's the feeling like I'm a part of something right. it's feeling connected and um, that's, that's my highest value and it was like saying that at that time was like heresy. It was like, you know, somebody, um, oh God, I forget who it was. Was it Copernicus that first said the world was round? Whoever that it was ends up getting killed for that. Um, it, that's <laughs> yeah. like, that's how I felt. Like I'm yeah. saying something so anathema to who we are as a triumvirate that you guys are just, now that I've left, you'd be like, yeah, we don't want you for even saying that. Hmm. Um, and, and they didn't. And they said, um, we feel exactly the same. Thank you for giving voice to that. Wow. We want to live a life of passion as well. Um, stick with us. Let's sell this company. And then let's do something that we all believe in. And so then That's the mechanism awesome. yeah. began turning into something more beautiful. That's great. So when was that time? So there was an initial time that it was do or die with, with your wife and you when you when you left, you branched out, right? To start well, Quest. Uh, it's, it gets a little muddy. So okay. here's the, the actual timeline. The do or die, the moment my wife said, I bet on you, was when I said, I'm going to quit. So mm. we built this company up. It's worth millions of dollars. And I say to her, I'm going to hand back my equity. Right. I'm not going to ask for anything I because see. I don't believe that I should. Yeah. And we're going to have to start over and build something from the ground up. But I want to live a life where I'm happy and passionate. But I promise you, like, I will make us wealthy. Like, I understand yeah. now what that means. It's got to be not just financial. It's got to be emotional as well. Right. So I'm going to make that happen. Yeah. And keep in mind, this is a woman that I made clip coupons for a distressingly long period of time. Right. And we were just now making real money. And I said, we're about to leave all of that behind us. And we're going to start afresh. Yeah. And back in poverty. Yeah. And, and go back a step, Tom. Even then, you went to her dad, right? When you well, now, went to... Now you're really going back. So um, I, I went to her dad uh, to propose. I love the story, by the way. Yeah, we, you, you tell this a little bit on Tony Robbins, yeah. Yeah, so I go to him and my wife and her family are very old school like that. And I want him to show respect. He's Greek, uh, grew up in Cyprus, uh, just a super legit dude, very successful businessman. And I come to him and I say, look, I want to ask for your daughter's hand in marriage. Oh, Tom, Tom, there's no rush. What's the rush? <laughs> uh, and he'd always been very kind to me. But the, the, his pitch was date, even live together, that's fine. But please don't get married. Really? And I said, sir, yeah. I, I respect that. Um, I hear what you're saying, but I want to be very honest with you. I am going to propose to your daughter. So ends up being a bit of a drama. Uh, but that will be when they make the movie. That will be like part of a movie you make someday, right? So. Yeah, someday, someday. And uh, so finally, we, we, he, and again, very, very important to acknowledge, he's always been incredibly kind and welcoming and warm and yeah, all that. Yeah. But his whole thing was... He's protecting his daughter. You know, like he'll do whatever it takes to protect his daughter. Sure. And yeah. at the time I proposed, I didn't have a job. Uh, I was broke, completely destitute, but a kid with big dreams. And his question to me was, you know, look, I have succeeded. I, uh, I have taken very good care of my daughter. My daughter is used to a certain lifestyle. 
how are you going to take care of her? And I said to him, look, I know, sir, what you see right now is an unemployed kid who doesn't know anything, but you've never met somebody more ambitious and more driven than me, and one day I will make your daughter wealthy. Right. And so, but keep in mind the position from which I'm saying that. I am totally broke. I'm living right. with my wife's now, then girlfriend. I'm living with my girlfriend's right. mother in the bedroom that my wife grew up in. I don't have a job. And, um, you know, so he's like, basically, I'll believe it when I see it. So now flash forward. Yeah, I think it's important to say that because then you're flashing forward. You have this opportunity. You have millions of dollars. You're pushing across the table that you could have and your wife saying, I bet on you. Right. So and then now flash forward. So my wife bets on me. Uh, we end up, the three of us, starting Quest. And it, it just explodes and becomes the second fastest growing company in America and worth valued over a billion dollars. And I take my father-in-law on a tour of the facility, which um, we've got 600,000 square feet. We've yeah, got yeah. over 1,400 employees. So, I mean, it's, it's just as far as the eye can see. It's equipment and people and, you know, all this stuff. And, right. and I turned to him and I said, uh, do you remember when you asked me how I would take care of your daughter? Right, I said, right. Yes. And I said, how am I doing? And he just cried. That's amazing. And he amazing. was like, this is, this is a beautiful and that beyond my wildest imaginations. And that is amazing. Thank you for telling that. Um, if, go back to the very beginning, though, because obviously you've grown a new huge company. In the very beginning, when you first branched out to start, what did that look like? It, it was nothing. I mean, literally, we were making the products at night by hand with rolling yeah. pins, with yeah. knives. And, you know, shout out to Mike Osborne, my business partner. He made tools that allowed us to. Really? Yeah, oh, absolutely. What's his background to make tools? He is a farm boy from Iowa. Wow. He is, he is literally an Iowa farm boy. I love that so much. You can't imagine. I've been to his farm, by the way. It's absolutely fantastic to see where this guy grew up. It's nuts. So anyway, he makes this stuff for us, and it allows us to scale. I mean, we're instead of having to cut one bar at a time, <laughs> it would like put an right. imprint. You on have to start somewhere, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, it would take. There was like seven or eight of us, and it would take us about six hours to make twelve hundred bars. To give you an idea of scale, we now make one point five million bars a day. Wow, that's unbelievable. So it's nuts. Absolutely crazy. So, Tom, talk about the product. So, what the product looked like then compared to, to now? Yeah, so we still think of ourselves as a tech startup. So, mm -hmm. even though we're no longer in the technology space, that's the ethos that we bring with us, which is get a viable product out into the market and then yeah. iterate to make it better. Yeah. And to us, it is, it is criminal that the rest of the food industry isn't the same. And the reason we think that that's so criminal and that customers – deserve better is that there are constant advancements in um, the science of metabolism. People actually understand better what you should be eating. Yeah. There's advancements in the science of ingredient sourcing. There's advancements in the science of manufacturing. So for instance, when the reason that a bar like ours didn't exist before we came along, which is a protein bar that was high in protein, had no sugar added. There's like a gram of sugar on our bars that comes from the nuts. It's just the way the FDA makes you label it. But sugar's literally not an ingredient. So uh, there's no sugar, but it tastes like cookie dough. I mean, it's bonkers, right? So the reason that no one had done that before wasn't that they couldn't also come up with a formulation. It's that when you try to mass produce that product, it can't be done on the equipment that currently existed at the time. So imagine every company going to the manufacturers that make this stuff, whether the equipment or just a, a contract manufacturer that mm -hmm. makes bars for other people, and you say, here's the product I want to make, they're all going to say, well, it can't be made because they have a fixed mindset. They don't right, have a growth right. mindset. They don't encounter that piece of information and go, oh, well, I take ownership for that. I can make you know, anything come true that I want. I just have to be willing to make my own equipment. So here we are with our Iowa farm. There you go. Like, right. oh, okay, well, I'll just build new equipment. No problem. Wow. So he re-engineers the equipment and off to the races we go. And the whole time we're like, and we start calling it the quest mindset, right? We're like, um, and this is the quest mindset at work because I know how many people came to all these same yeah. people and they said it can't be done and they went, okay, yeah. I guess it right. can't be done. Yeah. We hit that same obstacle and go, of course it can be done, just not on that equipment. You just have to make new equipment. Hey. <laughs> Problem solved. I mean, it ended up being way harder than we expected, of course. Right, right. But we at least had the audacity to try it. So is that how the name Quest came about? 
The name Quest came about because we wanted something that wasn't tied to any one product. Like we didn't want to be like way to go, W H E Y. You know, we wanted to to encapsulate the spirit of the brand. We wanted to because um, for us, we're not a protein company. We're a food company, and in fact, we're putting out a whole line of stuff now that's all based around fats, ketogenic. Yeah. Um, so we didn't want to trap ourselves. You know, we knew we want to end metabolic disease, absolutely massive, and we want people to understand that there's two sides of this equation. There's the body and there's the mind. Yeah. So we wanted to have a name that could encompass all of that. So yeah. that's yeah. why we went with that. So Plus Tom, it makes it about them and not about us. Yeah. So Tom, talk about some of the the turning points from like a marketing perspective. What was working well to help grow the company? Authenticity is the most powerful thing that we've done. We decided we wanted to make a company that was a real reflection of who we are as people. Um, and so we said, we're going to do this all socially, which allowed us to bootstrap mm. the company. We didn't have to spend a lot of money because we could advertise or market essentially for free. And it was go out, be us, be the kind of company we would want to see, um, be real, connect with these people, find out what their hopes and dreams are, try to serve them, and just deliver value. And that was our thing. So when you have that attitude on social media, people really gravitate towards it because they feel well taken care of. They could see that I actually care. Like on a personal level, like seeing that person transform and succeed, like that was just awesome for me. And that was why I got into it for my own family and I shared the story of my family and um, I'll, I'll give a, a perfect example. So in the early days when you know, there were so few of us, um, I was not only the president but I was also making the bars myself and right. I was the head of customer support. So if right. you wrote in and had a complaint, you were actually talking directly to me. Right. Uh, so one time somebody got a hair in their bar and I was like, oh, that is so gross. Oh man, I'm freaked out. <laughs> <laughs> and the way they wrote the letter was like I could tell they're expecting me to like position this legally, right? And like, hey, such is the nature of manufacturing and nothing can ever be perfect and to just list. We wear hairnets and – but I was like, forget that. That's nasty. Right. So I wrote back like that's gross. You must be really grossed out. I'm mortified that that happened. Like we are such freaks about making sure that our product is clean and that it's got integrity. But – we have failed. Like clearly, there is a hair in your bar. We have failed. That's so nasty. And you can actually still find that letter online because they ended up posting it. Really? Wow. Because they were like, I can't believe they responded like this. Like, so that was our whole shtick. Like, just yeah. really be real, be authentic. If you think something is gross, just own it. If you right. mess up, own it. Because we don't have a fixed mindset, right? So I know I have failed. I'm gonna recognize that for sure. Because if I don't and I fight like you're going to feel weird about it and then I'm going to be defensive versus open to change and growth. So we just owned things. We got better. We accepted our mistakes when we fell on our face and, and just tried to learn and get better. Right. Use the, come from their perspective, so to speak. Yeah, for sure. Um, and you guys have hired, I mean, obviously you have over 1,400 employees. So you've hired thousands of people. And your philosophy on hiring is really interesting. Um, you look for a grand vision. So... What um, are some staff that you end up hiring? Do you remember any of those huge visions when you had those conversations that made you decide to, they got your attention to hire them? Um, yeah, so I'll give you one. In fact, when we're done with this podcast, I'm actually doing, I'm like, I'm proper crestfallen about this, but I'm so excited for him. We're doing a goodbye party for one of the kids that we hired. Um, just an amazing kid, so really fast. His name is Carlitos. Carlitos Altamirano, man. So he starts out, he was 19 when we found him. Yeah, yeah. And put him on the line because he had no job experience. Put him on the line. This is a kid that was one time wanted for attempted murder. He's innocent. Wow. But nonetheless, wanted for attempted murder. His sister was killed, shot to death in his front lawn with an AK-47. Jeez. I mean, just he grew up hard, hard, hard in the projects here. Now, when you're in manufacturing, you end up being in the inner cities. So we had a lot of people with stories like that. Mm. But Carlitos was like, look, man, I really want want to do something special with my life. I, I want to um, you know, do something big. He didn't have a clear vision and what I actually look for is grand ambition. I'm looking for people that I want see. to do something big. Some yeah, of them yeah. may not know quite what it is yet, 
yeah. but they want to do they want to echo through this world right, right? right. So use Steve Jobs words they want to put a dent in the universe yeah. Carlitos wanted to put a dent in the universe he didn't know how he's going to do it but he was willing to work his way to get there and I said look I reward performance with opportunity so if you kill it on the line then I'll give you an opportunity somewhere else in the company yeah. and he did and here's this scrawny little 19 year old kid working on the line with ex-drug dealers former gang members I mean just hardcore people and he didn't take shit and sorry I don't know if, uh, he didn't uh, <laughs> push him around and uh, he just he rose up yeah. and became a, a line manager and just absolutely killed it yeah. and said Tom what I really want to do is I want to be on your technology team mm. and I'm like oh, <laughs> you want to be on the tech team I'm like have you ever even owned a computer no <laughs> do you by any chance know how to code that's the no. first question of hiring a tech person <laughs> have yes. you owned a computer exactly yeah. and and he hadn't and I said okay well here's where I have to put up or shut up I said cool you've performed I'm gonna give you an opportunity mm. You need to go teach yourself how to code. Go to Code Academy. We set them up. We offer to pay for any classes. Yeah. And then once you learn a modicum of um, skills, then we'll give you an internship. So yeah. he did that. We gave him an internship. I yeah. said, once you get to the point where um, you're worth paying in that role, then I'll pay you for that role. So yeah. he was working on the line, teaching himself code, doing the um, unpaid internship while working the line, wow. proving himself there, got to the point where we gave him a paid internship, then got to the point finally where he was a full-fledged member of the tech team. And now the reason that today is his last day is because he's starting his own company. Well, so here's this What's kid, it going to be? Um, in technology. So okay. he's got two co-founders and they're going to be essentially coders for hire. And they're going to go out and help people. Their specialties, Magento. There you go, Carlitos. Your first plug. Uh, they don't have a company name yet, or we need a website them. to plug this. Yeah. Yeah. So hopefully soon they'll have that. But it's it's just it's so beautiful to see yeah. him coming to his own. Yeah. And um, yeah, to forget about to, the subject, the title of this post being Tom or Quest or Fifty Seven Thousand. We're going to call it Carlitos Way. That, yes. That's that's going to be the name of the. Post. Nice. I like that. Yeah. Hell yeah. Um, so, you know, it takes a certain skill set, Tom, to go Tom, to go from entrepreneur to leader and CEO. What was the most challenging part of that transition? You're making the bars yourself, you're selling them, and now you have over 1400 employees and running a huge company. What's what's been the biggest challenge to transition to to that role? Entrepreneurs yeah. want to do everything themselves. So, as an entrepreneur, you you're the the gritty person that just gets it done, right? You hit an obstacle, you go over it, under it, through it, around it, whatever you have to do, but you don't stop at that obstacle. Like that to me is the very definition of an entrepreneur. Yeah. So, then as you scale your company, you realize you can't do everything yourself. Like you really want to and you absolutely cannot because you will halt the growth of your own company by trying to do it all yourself. So, now you have to work as a proxy. You have to work with other people, through other people, inspire motivate, paint a vision, keep everybody moving, moving in the same direction. And, and in doing that, in stepping back and functioning through other people, you really have to develop an entirely different skill set, which is not the, because um, in their early days, an entrepreneur, they're, they're a leader for sure, there's no question, but it's cult of personality. So I was on the line making bars every day. That's what I did. I wore a hairnet, a lab coat, you know, the latex gloves and I made protein bars. Yeah. Now, so how did you know that you should respect me? Because I would take the hardest job on the line, right? That was my thing. What do you guys think? What's the hardest job? What That's was the hardest, hardest job? job? Feeding the dragon. So feeding, and we called it the dragon because it was so demanding. It was so hard. Oh God, in the what early days. Yeah. I can still remember my hands cramping closed. <laughs> uh, because it, so what you'd have to do yeah. is the bars, you would, Take it out of the mixer and you have like a, call it a dough. It's not really a dough. It's a protein matrix. Huh? Don't think you do that <laughs> but, but we would get the matrix and we, you had to hand crumble it to get it all laid out smooth so that it would run through even so the bars were in different weights. Yeah. But then if you had a bar that was over or underweight, it had to recycle and go back. But now I've got a, I've got a bar. Yeah. You can't just put it back through. You have to hand crumble it all while fixing everything and getting it. So you take crumble, 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 ah, crumble. It was... Man, are there the videos of these like people doing this? Yes, that, there okay. are. There's actually. Some... I want to see a video on Inside Quest feeding the dragon video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll have to do that and compare it to what it looks like now because now those guys have it so easy and they don't even realize. <laughs> but 
Um, so yeah, you had to do that. The machine couldn't slow down, certainly couldn't stop. So you, the, when you first start doing it, your hands would get so fatigued that I would wake up in the middle of the night with my hands cramped and closed. <laughs> Sounds horrible. <laughs> crazy, crazy. But that's how people on the line knew that they could respect me, right? Because I just worked my ass off. It was leading by example. I was yeah, at the yeah. front. I wasn't a boss. I was really a leader. Right. Um, and, and so they could see that. They could see the hustle. They could see I cared about them. But now there are some employees, I'm embarrassed to say this, but when we've got 1,400 employees, there are some employees that don't even know who I am, mm. right? That I've never met them. Right. So now it's like they're, it's not about respect me, it's about respecting their line lead or yeah. it's about respecting the manager or the supervisor yeah. whatever. So now you've got to get that culture uh, to where that person also yeah. leads that ferociously yeah. and has a vision for their own life and is willing yeah. to bust ass and so it gets hard to do that. You just do that by hiring the right people or is there a certain training process you put like for the, for the leaders? Yeah, you have to train for sure. I think very, very few people are born into this world with the quest mindset. Um, and I think so. If you, the more experience you have, the less likely you are to have the quest mindset because yeah. the quest people get all that experience in organizations that teach mm. um, rank and file. Right, fall in line, do your job, do it well, don't ask questions, keep your head down, get your work done. And we're the exact opposite of that. Right, we right. want people thinking for themselves, being entrepreneurial, driving themselves right. forward, taking pride in what they do, believing in what they do, and trying to grow every day. And one of the 25 bullets of the Quest belief system yeah. is be at Quest for the exact number of days that it's the most selfish thing that you can do. The day that you come here thinking about me or thinking about right, Quest, right. it's not sustainable, man. This is yeah. your one life. This yeah. is your shot. So hopefully Quest has so much to offer you that it's a fair trade to do the work for all the other things that Quest gives you, better education, yeah. encouragement, uh, teaching the growth mindset, uh, you know, ab above average wages, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the moment it's not moving you towards your own selfish desires, yeah. and then yeah. go, go chase those. Yeah, I remember you hearing this, and this is the unique part of your interview process, which is you want them coming from a selfish perspective. Like I think you said it, both of you meet at your most selfish point, and that's when the person should come on board, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I don't say selfish to mean anything negative. We all live life from our own perspective, right? Right. right. Don't, don't worry about my passions. You have passions, right? What right. are those? Like, how can we help you tap into that and just be more fulfilled? Because here's my thing I'm phobic about people selling cheaply the same six and a half years that I sold, or worse, their entire right. working career. It's like, Living for retirement is the most terrifying right. vision for one's life that I can imagine. First of right. all, retirement's not guaranteed. You could die in like the next 15 minutes, right? So yeah. do today that which yeah. makes you feel most alive. Yeah, I'm going to give a shout out to June and Cindy for helping make this happen. And, and this reminds yes. me because I'm laughing at, I'm smiling inside because I'm watching a video of you when the power goes out. And like you call this kid out. I don't know if he was leaving, but you're like, <laughs> hey, are you leaving? Tom or Jim or whatever your name is and then but then you go back and June is like I think it was June like sitting working and you're like she's she's still cranking away and making it happen yeah. so it she reminds me of that kind of that quest mission right yeah yeah June does not play Cindy and June together are like the dynamic duo those two kids are just making it happen yeah so you know since this is inspired insider Tom I always ask uh, what's been the lowest point and then how you push through that tough time well, I've had low points where it was truly dark, and I've had low points where I had absolutely no doubt whatsoever that I would come out the other side. Mm. So um, my lowest point was when I quit Awareness Technologies. That, mm. that was um, just, whoo, uh, I had allowed myself to believe in a foolish thing, which is that money is yeah. an end in and of itself. Yeah. And once you realize that money has purpose, and when it's purpose-driven, then it is, it is all the things people think of when they think of money. Because here's the thing, wealth creation is amazing. Money will change your life. But the only thing money is good for is facilitating something else. So until you know what you want money to facilitate, it, it will be so soul draining. Yeah. But when you know, okay, I'm going to build wealth in service of delivering value, right? Yeah. Like I don't want to dime from anybody ever unless yeah. I've delivered more value than what else they could be spending that dime yeah. on, right? Yeah. I want to earn that. Yeah. So when you do that and you're like, I'm delivering value to these people's lives, I believe in what I'm doing, 
then you've got a real shot at making some money. And I know, like, I want to put my money to use serving the world. So that's why the vast majority of my net worth is tied up in Quest, because I really believe Quest is the most powerful vehicle to help people both physically and emotionally with Inside Quest. So yeah. it's like that, that to me is a no brainer. Yeah. Um, so, and then there's been times at the beginning of Quest when I already had the growth mindset. I was totally in, I knew what I was trying to do with my life. And I was just so willing to fight to make Quest a success yeah. that, dude, learning how to manufacture when you don't know is hard. It is unbelievably difficult. And just every problem you can imagine comes out mm. of the woodwork. So there were some incredibly low points where it just seemed like, gosh, man, are we ever going to get to the other side of this tunnel where we can actually get efficient at manufacturing? Mm. But even in the darkest, darkest days of that, there, mm. was, there was no sense of hopelessness. There was mm. no sense of being lost. I knew exactly what to do. Pushing through was easy because there's no fear of what's on the other side, right? right. I know I'm going to get there. I yeah. will survive. I will push yeah. through this. This problem will buckle under the weight of my will. When yeah. you're there, it's, it's very different. Yeah. So what was the biggest sacrifice when you look back in awareness technologies days that you like, I can't believe I didn't go to that anniversary take, or what? I, was there, you know I neglected what I mean? my wife in, in, in a thousand just overall. Weeks. A thousand ways big and small. I could pick any one yeah. anniversary and just say that one. But um, yeah, and my wife is somebody who I no longer take for granted. She is very clearly my number one priority. She's the absolute yeah. center of my universe, and I yeah. act in accordance yeah. with that. So, Tom, on the flip side, the proudest moment? It just ever? Yeah. Business, personal. I have two that I want to talk about with you, um, but yeah. Um, I, I'm proud of things. So when we were named as the second fastest growing company in North America and we had done it entirely in service of other people um, and just gutting it out, sheer force of will after my wife saying she bets on me. I mean like all of those things culminating in one and standing there mm -hmm. with it was my two brothers, Mike and Ron, you know, at least my, my spiritual brothers, right. Mike and Ron, my wife who just means the absolute world to me, and then uh, Ron's wife, Shannon, and Mike's wife, Kay, just like those five people outside of my immediate family, those five people are the most important people in my life. And to share that night with them, the award ceremony, yeah. it, it, we've just all become the people we needed to become to, mm -hmm. to be standing there and to have done it together as a team and for there to be so much love, like, oh, I know that sounds so cheesy, but dude, for me, like, that was just incredible. It was a culmination of everything. There's sure. two I had written down, which is one, because it kind of comes from your early mission, which is one, your sister chain, making a big change, right? Yeah. Uh, and the, I would never say that's one of the things I'm most proud of because she owns that. Like, right. That woman, that woman has transformed herself as a human being. She'll be the first to tell you that we were the catalyst for that change. Yeah. But, dude, she made all the hard decisions. She right. showed up. Sure, she ate sure. the right things. She worked out. It's, I, I'm honored by that. She's yeah. amazing. That's kind of like the end result of your mission, you know. I mean, people have to take it in their own hands. But, for sure. But, yeah. And the other one is there's an interesting story. I was listening to it that you – there was a study done with dogs. Yeah. What, what, tell about, talk about that for a second. All right, that's man, this, really cool. This is all right. This this is what you want to really understand. Quest, then understand epigenics. So my business partner Ron. So we started the company for three very different reasons. For me, it's about helping people. Plain and simple. That's it. Like I am so wired to be uh, empathetic, and just seeing other people do something amazing is incredible. Yeah. My business partner Ron is really fascinated by. Uh, puzzles, challenges, and he wants to understand metabolism and crack some of these mysteries that other people have sort of given up on or they're looking in the wrong direction. So yeah. um, he read this book, and in the book, they talk about the Warburg effect. And the Warburg effect is that cancer cells can only burn glucose. They can't burn fat. So the human body can burn fat or, or glucose. It can do either. Uh, but cancer cells share a mutation that makes it impossible for them to burn fat. So mm. Warburg, in 1926, put out the, the hypothesis that, well, if that's true, then you should be able to starve the cancer cell uh, dietarily and not right. eat things that contain glucose and, right. and it should die. Yeah. But nobody's done anything with that because there's no, um, 
financial pot of rainbow or no financial pot of gold at the end of that rainbow, which is there's nothing to patent, there's no drug, it's just diet. So Ron read that and was like, wait a second, somebody's got to get on this. He starts researching. He realizes that there's researchers out there that are looking at this, but they're so woefully underfunded. So we found Epigenics, which is our nonprofit, mm-hmm. all to fund this research to find out if you can, from a dietary perspective, really end cancer. And the, um, one of the things that Epigenics funded is this thing called Keto Pet Sanctuary. Keto yeah. Pet Sanctuary took dogs with naturally occurring cancers. Yeah. They were on kill lists at shelters because they thought, there's nothing we can do with these dogs. Right. And we said, well, if the Warburg effect is true, we should be able to stop the cancer in these dogs. So right. we brought them in. We use human level, human level diagnostics on these dogs, um, PET CT scans, biopsies, histologies, the whole mm-hmm. nine to find out they really do have cancer. We document that. And then we treat them with a dietary protocol. Now, ketogenics, for those who don't know, very simply, a ketogenic diet is high fat, low protein, virtually no carbohydrate. So um, if you think of, uh, uh, like, we have a bunch of ketogenic products on Quest Labs. If anybody wants to sign up for Quest Labs, it's online only. Uh, But go to questnutrition.com forward slash Quest Labs. Learn all about ketogenics there. Um, But we have a bunch of products that range from 2 to 1 to 4 to 1. And the two to one products mean for every combined gram of protein and carbohydrate that you eat, you eat two grams of fat on the, the two to one mm-hmm. end or four if you're doing four to one. Yeah. Um, and, but they taste like candy bars, peanut butter cups, right. uh, got all kinds of right. amazing, amazing products. Um, and, and we really believe, and look, we're super cautious. People should read the literature for themselves. Right, right. We don't, we're not making any claims. Like People need to go see, just from a metabolic standpoint, what yeah. triggers this that may, may, may make ketogenics the most potent right. um, weapon in the fight against cancer. Yeah. But just to talk sort of data for a second, the, I think we've had just under 50 dogs go through our program. Again, this is with human-level diagnostics, PET CT scans. We put them where the only people in the world doing that on canines right, right. Um, and showing that these dogs are... Um, well, the one thing that I can say across the board on all dogs, not a single dog has had a case of metastasis. Mm. So even if that's as far as ketogenics right. goes, that it stops cancer from metastasizing, right. it would be the biggest breakthrough in, in cancer treatment since chemotherapy. There mm. may be more, and, and this will all come yeah. out. Yeah. We've had some dogs go actually pet negative, meaning they, they, you put them in a PET scan and they test positive for cancer. Uh, and then after a dietary protocol, they end up testing negative in a PET scan. Yeah. So incredibly, incredibly encouraging signs coming out. We're going to be publishing the study that we did on the canines. Yeah. Uh, we're now moving into human trials. Again, this is all yeah. through epigenics. But moving into human trials, be very yeah. interesting to see what the results are there. It's yeah. just, again, it's incredibly early. We're not making any claims. Right. Who knows if, if the data holds. And sure. I, I really do hate that I have to say all that. Yeah. I'd love to just show my enthusiasm. But yeah. we're super cautious. Sure. Um, we want people to make decisions for themselves, to go yeah. out, read the literature, learn about it. Yeah. But the great thing about ketogenic is it, it's not faith-based, right? right? All you need to do is t- take your blood levels. Eat, test your blood. Where's your blood sugar? Where are your ketones? And you keep those in a certain yeah. ratio. That's what we've done with the dogs to see the results. Humans should try it on themselves, see yeah. where they go. Yeah. Um, it's, it's incredibly potent. Tom, I got excited when I heard that. So I'm going to be excited, enthusiastic, even though you have to put all the disclaimers in now. Yeah. So thank you for everything you're doing, Tom. It's amazing. Where should we point people toward so they check out more about you, you know, your show, and then all the nutrition? Yeah, so there's two. Go to InsideQuest.com to learn about InsideQuest, or you can go straight to YouTube, youtube.com forward slash InsideQuest. But check out the show. And then on the uh, body side, the cancer side, all of that stuff, it's questnutrition.com. Yeah. And then you get both sides of the equation. Tom, fantastic. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Absolutely, man. Thanks for having me on. It was really an honor. I appreciate yeah, it. Thanks. All right. Take care. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand